And joining us now is Dave Meslin. He is the project coordinator for something called Better Ballots, and that's where we're going to start. What's Better Ballots? Better Ballots is a new project. It's a citywide initiative. We're wor working with a multipartisan team um, representing the whole political spectrum, looking at ways to make our city elections more relevant, more representative, more diverse, more interesting, and more fair, and more accessible and inviting. Do you know that there actually is an appetite for any of those things in this city? Absolutely. I can't prove it empirically, <laughs> but uh, we've been talking to a lot of people, and I think um, despite the mythology that people are apathetic, I don't think you'll find a single person who truly doesn't care about the services in their city and the decisions that are made at City Hall that affect our lives. And one of the mythologies, too, is that City Hall doesn't make important choices, that all the big choices are made at the federal and provincial level, when in fact, I would say our day-to-day -day lives are more affected by City Hall than the other two. Everybody says that, but it still doesn't seem to be enough to prompt people to get off their couches and go vote when Election Day comes, right? Some do, uh, about 35 percent, which, pretty which low. still leaves a big chunk. Yeah. It's the lowest out of the three levels. It has the lowest turnout. Uh, there are different incentives and models and mechanisms we could look at that could boost those numbers. I want to share, speaking of numbers, some numbers that you guys have got on your website and uh, share these with our viewers and then we'll come back and talk about this. Here, the issue of diversity on Toronto City Council is a big deal. Women as a percentage of Toronto's population are 52 percent. Women elected in 2003 municipally, 32 percent. Women elected in 2006, 22 percent. How about visible minorities? As a part of the population in the City of Toronto, 47 percent. Visible minorities elected in the 2003 election, 13 percent. Visible minorities elected in the 2006 election, 11 percent. Dave, it's obvious these numbers are going in the opposite direction that folks like you who care about these things want these numbers to go in. How come? Well, it shows how important this work is, because one thing we're told sometimes is that we should be patient, that issues around people being excluded, whether they're women or other marginalized communities, that if we're patient, over time things will shift. And as the numbers showed that you just had on the screen, as you said, it's actually going down. It shows that something's wrong with the system. Not that a bunch of white men can't make good choices, but any healthy functioning democracy will, will, will create a net result that reflects the body that elected it. So it shows that, that something's wrong. People are being excluded from the process. Every step of the process, from nominations to voting to all the things that happen in between. And that's a, that's a uh, nine-month period. Uh, let me challenge you a bit on that, because yes, the numbers are not going in the direction in which you'd like to see them, but that does not in and of itself prove that the system is broken or that people are, you know, somehow having, you know, doors put up in front of them that they can't go through. I mean, it could be other alternative explanations as well, like other people in the city aren't interested in municipal politics, for example. So how do you know you're right on that one? Well, I know for a few ways. One is that I ran a project in 2006 called City Idol. And um, City Idol is really what inspired me to create Better Ballots four years later. And City Idol was uh, kind of a takeoff on American Idol or Canadian Idol. But instead of people competing with their songs and their voices, they got on stage and they gave a pitch of why they would make the best city councillor. And we created it in a really fun, inviting, creative way that felt inclusive. And it was a big risk, because we could have ended up with no one wanting to run, or maybe candidates on stage, but no one wanting to watch. Essentially, it's, it's like a speech night, a night mm -hmm. of speeches. And what we had was 70 candidates on stage, 600 people in the audience, great ideas. The candidates were so diverse, you would have thought that it was scripted through some kind of um, equity policy. But it wasn't. It was just Toronto. And the four candidates who won out of a totally open, democratic, fair process uh, one of them was a white male. Okay. Uh, I, I, the, there, there's just so much. And also, if you look at the other candidates who are running, it's not as if women and candidates of color aren't on the ballots. They're not winning, which has to do with who's voting, um, when we vote, how we promote the election, and also how the voting structures work, how we count the votes. There's or maybe there's, they're not as qualified or not as energetic or don't work as hard or don't, I mean, there's a hundred just, other explanations. It's so unlikely. That, that, that would defy all logic. So because if you look at any other sector, um, this is actually the one sector that's lagging behind the most. So you're um, convinced it's a systemic problem in, in, at City Hall that we've got to fix? Absolutely. I mean, if that was the case, if it was just a case of somehow women or people of color just couldn't hack it, you wouldn't have the kind of 
leaps and bounds we're making in other realms, including the corporate sector. And it's kind of embarrassing that the, the private sector is so much ahead of the game than our own governments. Okay. Uh, apart from the diversity issues, apart from the lack of female representation at City Hall, what other problems do you see right now with the way things are operating? We've identified four. We've already mentioned two of them. One is turnout. Turnout is under 40 percent. Mm -hmm. Again, in a city where I believe everyone truly cares is a huge problem. It means people either don't believe in the system, don't believe that who they, who they vote for will change anything. And there might be some people who are just completely happy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You'll never get 100 percent voting because uh, some people maybe think everything's just fine. Number two, turnover. How often are sitting councillors defeated? You would think that on a, on a council of 45 seats, you'd have four, five, six, maybe ten uh, in each election that, that the, the uh, voters didn't want them back. We find that there's about one ever, on average. Yeah, it almost never happens. Yeah, sometimes two. Very rare occasions we get two out of the 45 where a sitting councillor is defeated. That doesn't make mm. sense to me. Well, why would you not infer from that that everybody's content with the way things are running at City Hall and therefore they want to re-elect their incumbent member? Well, one, here I do have empirical evidence. Uh -huh. um, there's actually uh, this, this thing happens when you don't have a runoff vote, which is the most common way to elect something. In fact, the Academy Awards just switched over to a, a runoff vote. They're having their first one uh, this year. Um, you can have the situation where someone can win an election even if most people didn't vote for them. In fact, in 2006, 14 city councillors were elected with less than 50% of the vote. Half of those were sitting councillors who had been in office for three years, had all the advantages of incumbency, the name recognition, and they were rejected by a majority of their voters who didn't want them back. It happens in Parliament. And they won anyways. Yeah, but it happens in Parliament all the time. That's uh, our system. Only in three or four countries in the world that don't have either a proportional or a ranked ballot system. It's actually very unheard of. It's very unusual that Canada and Toronto use systems that allows a loser to win an election, including our current federal government. Okay, well, so your project is called a better ballot. Yeah. What's on your better ballot? Well, as I said, we brought together a whole group of people, and we each have our personal opinions of which system we think is best. But we thought the best approach, instead of everyone advocating for their um, preference, we're putting all the cards on the table. We're facilitating a citywide dialogue to inform people about the problems. I don't think people are aware of how bad the stats are uh, in terms of gender, in terms of ethnicity. Uh, when you tell people that out of the 10 seats in Scarborough, 10 seats, there are zero women. No female counselors in the entire city, and you can tell me that there's no qualified women in Scarborough who want to run. There's, there's something wrong. So we want to build that awareness that, that, that we can raise our expectations and we can expect more from our elections. And number two, we want people to know that there's so many ways to run a city election. And if you go outside of Toronto, not far, not to Europe, not to Australia, just to the U.S. and around Ontario and around the other provinces, you'll find all these mechanisms that other cities are using to make their elections more fair and accessible. Okay, give me an idea for Toronto. Well, there's a few that come up all the time. One, of course, is term limits. And John Tory, when he was formerly a potential candidate for mayor, he was talking about supporting term limits. Uh, various columnists have been supporting it. It's an obvious way to introduce new blood into a council and ensure that people can't stay in there for life. The con of that, of course, is that you could lose an amazing councillor who everyone wants. And I think it's really important for me to say that there is no perfect democracy. Mm -hmm. There's no perfect system. And every proposal we're putting forward has pros and cons. And sure. what we're saying is the only way we can make an informed decision as a city as to what system would work best for us is if everyone's well aware and informed about both the pros and the cons. You know they went through that, though, 15 years ago in the States. The Republican contract with America, they came in, all these Republicans <clears throat> champing at the bit to get into office, running on term limits storming the barricades on term limits, and they got in there and they realized it takes more than two terms to kind of figure out where the bathrooms are and get stuff done. And all those people who promised to, uh, you know, two terms and out, they recanted and they went back on it. So term limits may not be the panacea that a lot of people think they are. Nothing is a panacea. Okay. Um, term limits, and there's different ways to do term limits. You can have term limits where you, 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 uh, there's a certain threshold you have to get to come into the third term, or you miss your third term and you can come back for a fourth. It could be three terms of four years, four terms of two years. There's lots of different ways of looking at it. And like I said, it's probably one of the most controversial ones because mm -hmm. the negative side is so clear. Um, but it's also one that, that people are, feel very strongly about in terms of championing. Another obvious one, of course, is parties. I was just going to bring that up. Um, Party politics, we, we don't 
I mean, we do have it to a certain extent at City Hall right now, but we don't have it as brazenly as we do at the provincial or federal level. What, yeah. what are the pluses of going to party politics at City Hall? Well, the obvious reason to look at it is that both Vancouver mm -hmm. and Montreal have it. So we have, you know, concrete examples where we can go and see how it's working without it being a theoretical exercise. Mm -hmm. We can see what's happening on the ground. The best argument in favor of having parties would be that, first of all, they already exist behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And that, in a way, gives you the worst of both worlds. Because you have the parties, but they're not accountable. There's no policy convention. There's no nomination process that's transparent. There's no fundraising mechanisms for what they do in between election. There's no leadership race. So it would illuminate and shine some light on something that's already happening. The downside could be that you end up with blocks voting as parties rather than 45 independent councillors. Now, they already do vote sometimes as blocks, but they vote much more independently than we have at Queen's Park or Ottawa. And the NDP's been basically running party politics as an organized caucus for, uh, I don't know, 30 years now, I think, almost. In City Hall? Yeah. They try. I yeah. mean, all the parties try and influence in <clears throat> different ways. The NDP's probably has the most influence under the current administration. They used to hold official nominations, though, mm -hmm. and people would run with the party sign um, on, their, on their signs. I was at an AGM for COPE, one of the parties in Vancouver, two or three years ago, and it was neat to be in a room where citizens were voting on party policy in between elections. That said, I wouldn't want to see council become a place where everyone rose and sat based on how they were told to vote by the whip. So it's, it, would depend how we, it would depend how we implemented it. It could be, could be good, could be bad, and that's the whole point of better ballots. People haven't really thought this through in an open, facilitated way. People are almost scared to talk about these ideas in Toronto. And I just wanted to clarify, you're not actually coming here today saying we need term limits, we need party politics. You're saying we need to look at it. And I think we need something. I mean, out of the 10 or 12 options, I, don't, I wouldn't see us coming out of this process saying, oh, forget it, we're fine mm -hmm. as it is. Clearly something's wrong. The question is, is it term limits? Is it ranked ballots? Is it parties? Is it weekend voting? Both Montreal and Vancouver, if we're looking at large Canadian cities, mm -hmm. vote on the weekend. Um, and technically, your, your, you know, your boss has a, an obligation, if you have an employer, to give you time off work. But that, has, that doesn't always translate into a comfortable way to actually do it. If you're working on a factory line, you're going to just walk away for an hour and mm -hmm. vote. There's a lot of pressure on, on, on many workers to stay on the job all day. Weekend voting could open up that opportunity to vote for a lot of people. We've got 45 uh, voices on Toronto City Council right now. Uh, too many? Too few? You think we need to change the number of seats? It's hard to say. I mean, the city is so big, mm -hmm. uh, we can change that. Toronto voted against amalgamation, but we're stuck with it. Mm -hmm. One way to do it would be to have a borough system, which Montreal has and New York sort of has, where instead of de-amalgamating a, a, a city to deal with the democratic damage done by amalgamation, because it really removed City Hall from so many people. If you live in East Scarborough or West Etobicoke or North end of North York, you're literally miles and miles and miles away from your city hall as you weren't before. So one option is to create boroughs where you're electing your citywide council, but you're also electing a local borough council. So you might end up theoretically with more politicians, but they'd be operating on different jurisdictions. That is I wouldn't the theory of everything old is new again. I mean, that's the way it used to be. Sort of, except it's the opposite. It would be um, levels operating underneath instead of regional on top. But in, in, a, in a way, it's the same. But Montreal has that combined with the party system, and you end up with some neat results where just a few months ago they had an election and one party won the city, and I was hanging out with a friend in the plateau area, and a different party won that neighborhood. So it kind of creates a, a more interesting dynamic. I think the problem with politicians is you don't want too many because it gets confusing. If you have 100 people in a room debating an issue, especially if there isn't a party structure and it's 100 independent voices, mm -hmm. at the same time, the wards right now are so large that you're representing between, let's say, 45 to 60, 70,000 people. I don't think anyone could honestly say that a single politician could represent 100 or 200 or 300,000. So I've heard proposals to go from 44 councillors down to 22. Mm -hmm. That would mean that you're representing over 100,000 people. How could those people possibly have access to you as a councillor? Well, that's how they do it provincially and federally. Each and how many people feel that they have a close connection to their MP or MPP? Okay, fair point. Another um, whole series of models is multi-member districts, which uh, can mean a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But one thing it opens the door to is a proportional outcome. 
and there's four or five different ways of doing that. Some would, some would need amendments to the Municipal Elections Act, and some wouldn't. Some we could do right now under the City of Toronto Act. But essentially what it allows is, um, if you have a group that represents 20% of the voting bloc, and they feel a certain way, under the current system, they'll get shut out of every single ward. Mm -hmm. If you took groups of five wards and c combined them into larger wards, then that group would win one of those seats. So instead of 45 seats, you'd have nine, nine wards with five each. Mm -hmm. And those groups that represented a 20% minority view could win a seat in each one. So it's a proportional outcome. It does mean the wards are technically much bigger, but you have five councillors. It can be confusing, but it also creates a lot of interesting opportunities. Let me and, ask and, and, and that's being done. Vancouver doesn't have any wards yeah. at all. Um, Cambridge uses a proportional counting model called STV, which, um, which is, um, has been proposed here for provincial politics, and they're using it there at City Hall. So there, there really is so many options, and the deeper you look into it, the more interesting it is. Okay, this is obviously not going to be, none of this will be in place in time for the municipal elections happening this fall. No. So you're trying to kickstart some debate that presumably, if you're successful, will translate into some kind of action four years down the road when we have the next municipal election. Yeah. My question is, how, how do you get from here to there? How does this debate, you know, how do you get people engaged? How do, how's this going to happen? Well, we're doing it already. I'm, we're doing it right now. Mm -hmm. And thank you for playing your role as the media. Uh, we've had a lot of media support for this, and it shows that people are hungry to hear about ideas of how democracy could work better. Because no one wants to believe that people just don't care or don't want to vote. Um, it's a multi-stage project. We're going to use this city's election while people are thinking about city politics to get them thinking about not just who's running, but how we run and how we count and how the ballot looks. And we're going to use the results to point out once again that our system um, isn't giving us the results that we deserve as a city. Unless something miraculous happens, those um, ratings of turnover and diversity and turnout aren't going to improve much in 2010. The next step is to go to Queen's Park. And what we're hoping we can get is some kind of amendment to the Municipal Elections Act that doesn't change anything except give cities options. It would be, uh, I think they call it enabling legislation mm -hmm. that says, because uh, the province, of course, is in charge of what cities do for the most part. So it would say to the cities, if you want to have parties, you can, and this is how it would be regulated. If you want to have term limits, you can, this is how you do it. If you want to have ranked ballots or multi-member districts or weekend voting or extend voting rights to non-citizens, um, this is how you do it. And then it would be up to the citizens of each city to figure out which system works best for them and what's good for Toronto might not be right for London or Hamilton or Peterborough or Wawa, and they would have to go and advocate to their councils and say, we want term limits, we want parties, we want ranked ballots. One thing we do have, we do have limits on time uh, for these conversations. And ours, sadly, has come to an end. But we're grateful you came in to tell us all about better ballots. Dave Meslin, thanks so much. Thanks, Steve.